welcome to the sounding board and and a, a, a new panel. My name is Gary Bourgeois. I'll be moderating. I was asked to moderate because everybody knows that I don't have any problems. <laughs> okay. Uh, uh, so basically, our, our panel today consists of uh, Alison Moore, who's uh, representing the uh, Foley artists in the group, uh, Alex Gibson, who's uh, in the uh, music department, and uh, I've worked with for so many decades, and it's really great to see you. Um, Craig Hannigan, uh, who's a sound supervisor, and as is Dane Davis, and also production mixer uh, Lee Orloff. Uh, and he's going to be bringing a lot of our audience to uh, the production set uh, because many of us are in post production, and it would be really good to hear from somebody who has a different set of, of problems and issues to deal with uh, all the time. Um, so today's uh, basic uh, platform is, you know, solving uh, problems or, and issues or concerns uh, within our own individual crafts platform. And uh, I was thinking that I would like to break it down so that each of our panel members here gets to speak a little bit about their own uh, set of uh, issues that crop up on a regular basis. Obviously, individual problems come up from time to time, but they're less of a concern than ones that are general to us all. Um, I sort of broke down uh, what we, you know, what we view as our problems, our, our issues to physical issues, which, um, and that sometimes is a budget, sometimes time management, sometimes schedule, that sort of thing. Uh, number two would be management concerns, dealing with the producers or the production company, uh, post-production supervisor, and the director themselves. Also, uh, a third one would be workflow issues, which, uh, you know, we all have different sets of, of workflow issues depending on our, our, uh, our niche. Um, and also then the last one for me was communication uh, problems, which sometimes is just a matter of uh, not people not being on the same page or, or not being uh, willing to uh, bend if necessary. For instance, the picture department liaising with the, the sound department and the, the two assistants find themselves on different pages and talking about change notes and how they're prepared and all that sort of thing. Um, so these are the basic like four brackets that I came up with, but I'm sure that there are other uh, issues that individuals here will bring up. Um, and so what I'd like to do is start out by uh, calling on Allison, uh, if she may, and maybe we can go around and describe what our issues would be, and then we'll go around a, a second time and talk about the solutions. And then I'm sure we'll get a whole lot of questions to be able to bandy about and ask all of you guys. We all have something really important to, to bring to the table, and I'm really, really honored to be with such a distinguished group. Thank you very much for <laughs> being here today. So, Allison, talk to us about the sort of things that occur in the Foley world that you find that you have to basically address on a fairly regular basis? I think probably it's uh, the time constraint of um, how much time we have on a feature film versus a television show versus a video game. And um, it's just trying to get that balance of what is needed and um, how we can get everything done, you know, get, get, what they need in that amount of time. So um, I, I think it's just about all working together. I found that the older I get, um, that I find that everybody's more now a team instead of us against them. Like, ah, we're just gonna throw it to Foley. And sometimes we just don't have that amount of time to do things. So, and it's the communication of hey, you're going to need snow today, so you might have to call the ice house and get some snow ice in, or there's a big eating queue or food queue. Um, 
so I think it's 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 communication, which has to do with time, time planning. So and preparation. Pardon me. And preparation. And preparation, no. exactly. Yeah. yeah. And do you find that you have a, a shorter amount of time nowadays or the same as it always has been? Has that changed at all? I think what's changed for us is, you know, in the olden days when they hung single stripe and full coat and you only had four tracks of Foley that you could have, then it went with a DA88 to eight tracks. And now, of course, it's unlimited tracks. Um, it's more work with less downtime, you know, because also you used to, you know, when you would change a reel, it would take 15 minutes. So that would give you time to collect props or go to the bathroom or do what you needed to do. So, um, in one sense, it's a lot more work we're doing, but in another sense, we're separating things more. So it kind of goes faster instead of doing instead of walking two characters together with your partner and doing cloth movement at the same time, since it's separated, it, it does go a little quicker. So d double the work, but I think um, it's more efficient. And are, are people, uh, is the sound supervisor asking for more detail than they used to, or is that about the same as always? I think they are asking for more detail depending on what the project is. But you you know, we we've, we've been very fortunate to have enough time to um to be able to give them the detail. And also I have you know, I have to say that working with Dane, Dane is one of the only supervisors I've worked with who actually has days to just prepare for, you know, let's do some sounds. Let's Let's see how this is going to sound, and that's going to sound without even actually working on a reel, and that is a luxury. And I think that it shows um, when you're able to not have that pressure to come up with the sound of Mars footsteps, you know, right on. You know, you right. got to come up with that sound, and sometimes it takes a while to get there. Well, I, I certainly think that uh, uh, that's a common thing for all of us, where if we're given enough time to be able to experiment and stretch. Uh, we bring far more, far more to the table, and uh, that yeah. is that is expected. And then all of a sudden, everybody's like really happy and surprised, and it all goes well. And they see the effort being put into it, but they don't realize that th just that one thing of a little bit more time and preparation makes such a big difference. Yeah. It really does. And I think also the key is when you've worked with people for a long time, and you have that rhythm going where you know what they want, so it's they trust you more what you're coming up with. So right, that's right. Do, you, do you just out of curiosity, do you find that there is any sort of a supervision that comes into play that does anybody come and uh, ask to sit in on the session because they want some certain things that are specific? Yeah, that does. Yeah, that happens when they have time. You know, of course, um, we had a supervisor that we'd never worked with before who that for two hours because there was an issue he was hearing on the stage that actually had been going on for a little while and he pinpointed everything out and it was worth it for him to be there and um, he's just got a supersonic um, hearing so um, yeah that was really what? great that he could sit with us <laughs> yeah <laughs> but yeah I, I do love I do like it when um, when supervisors sit on the stage because then you really you know you're not second guessing um, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. what they want you're you know pretty much um, not giving five or six different um, alternates of, right. of things very good so, and yeah. you do you work in the same stage all the time? We do now. You know, our stage um, got closed down and was made into a dub stage after John left. So for a few years, we were sort of floating between Warner Brothers and a place called The Barn. And once the pandemic hit, for some reason, there was just a shift in energy. And we're now the day crew at Warner Brothers. So, um Good. That's been really nice. Yeah. I think that there was a shift in energy for everybody. 
you know. Yeah, and, uh, I have, it worked and, out well for me. So <laughs> in some cases, it was it's it became non-energy. <laughs> yeah. We'll we'll circle back in a in a bit. I'd like to call on uh, Alex, right? and, and uh, I know that we've worked together for a long time and and had a great time. Um, most music editors are attached to a given composer or, or a couple of composers. Some people are just like uh, ad hoc and all around. Um, do you find that your sort of issues with what you have to deal with comes from uh, new people or people that you've worked with for a long time and you already know what they're all about? Uh, it's obviously the new people well, that don't know any of the things that we do, new directors, uh, new picture editors, it's always much more difficult. You haven't established any kind of flow and starting from scratch, and there's no time to start from scratch these days. Right, so time is an issue. Yeah. Yes, time yeah. is big and issue. How do you deal with, for instance, uh, picture editors who have their assistants choose music that they'll never be able to afford or put it in in a way that's awkward to the cuts. Uh, how do you diplomatically uh, tell them to stop? <laughs> that's a, that is a tough one, or, or pulling things off of YouTube. Uh -huh. uh, with no idea what it is. Uh, I have to... Ex explain what is happening to them and to the picture editor and director. Just say, you know, don't get married to this because we'll never afford it. They won't even, you know, allow it. Mm -hmm. But it is hard because if you alienate that first assistant, you are, you're not going to go well. Right. They have to be your best friend. They know everything. They know absolutely everything yeah yeah so you have to you have to tiptoe you can you can suggest alternate cuts hey look i tried this or that's about it and are and you, you call are you, the supervisor and say get on them <laughs> yeah, <deal> with it. <laughs> well I, I must say that when when problems arise going up the ladder to help solve them uh it's not something that everybody does but quite often it solves the problem quite quickly, you know. Pretty quick. Um, yeah, yeah. At what, at what point are you brought in? <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> That's okay. Um, at what point are you brought in and and do you find that it's uh, it completely changes the whole rhythm of things if you're brought in late? I mean, quite, quite often, I think maybe the music editor is brought in before the composer is chosen and then it becomes like a whole different set of can of worms. Uh, yes. Uh, we're lately though, I'm brought in a couple weeks after the director's cut starts, which is nice. It's a little bit more than it used to be. You used to have like two weeks to slam something together. But now there's a little more time and from before the composer, the only issue is all the work leading up to that first temp will eventually be thrown out. So if you have a composer, you can start using demos and, 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 and work from temp to final as one movement. And, and basically, uh, you would probably use that composer's previous score uh, for temp so that they're used to the sound of that composer. But it must be very difficult when you temp and then they ask the composer to copy that style as opposed to their own. Oh, that that's all based on time. If the composer does not have time, he's got to deliver something. So he's got to deliver something that they like. So uh, it could be close to the temp. So they're always right. asking, do they like the temp? Do they like the temp? Right, right. And so you have to be really careful about what you proffer 
for the temp. True. Uh, lately, though, I've been working with directors who coerce their composers to write well in advance. So we have a lot of new music to, to temp with. And in some cases, the entire temp is new stuff. Right. Wow, really. that's, that's nice. Very nice. Very and nice. I, 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 and I, I must say, I, my experience is that the, the composers that are really, or not the composers, the, the directors that are really uh, cognizant of, of music are like inf infinitely more easy to work with that, that, pe that people have no musical background at all. Yes, they know what they don't like. Yeah. Right. Which is they, the worst thing you can hear. Yeah, yeah. And now, are you, I remember where uh, music editors were so important on the scoring stage, you know, setting up click cracks and doing all sorts of, do you still get called to go onto the, the scoring stage? I haven't been on for 20 years. Wow. <laughs> wow. Composers, they have their well-greased team. Uh -huh. And it's all part of their prep. I'm surprised that you, you don't go to the scoring sessions just on the basis of being able to hear what changes are made during those sessions. Well, I, I do, but it's more as a spectator. Which is That's sad. <laughs> no, it's, you, have a lot to, you have a lot to bring in. And I don't know of a music editor that isn't a pretty high class musician on their in their own right and quite often composers in their own right, like yourself. Well, by the time we hit the scoring stage, all the all those suggestions and things have already played out. You know what I mean? Yeah. So it, there's no time for any changes on a on a scoring stage. You just gotta lay down what you've written pretty much. Uh, although I, I do recall some some directors who uh, view themselves as being written on stage itself. Yeah, yeah, that's can be trouble too. Yeah, I, I for what it's worth, and I'll bring it up, but I I've done twenty one projects with Ivan Reitman, and uh, he got his degree in music and felt quite at home changing things on the scoring stage. Well, wow. that's back That's back when they had two weeks to score the movie. True. You know what I mean? Yeah. Now they have yeah. like four days, three or four days. Yeah. And just out of curiosity, how much uh, scoring is done on a large live stage with a full orchestra as opposed to smaller uh, home studios and a lot of electronics. It, it, what's the balance like these days? Well, COVID kind of wrecked the big the big scores. Uh, even though I've been on shows where they had, you know, 50 people record at home, send in their tracks and to build the orchestra that way. But uh, I've seen less the big orchestras Mm -hmm. and more smaller groups mixed with samples. And I, I have a, a question for uh, the, the issues. And it's one of mine that has to do with the music thing. And that is that uh, because there's so much being done uh, where they're mixing down at, at home studios that almost everything is delivered in just left, right stereo pairs, as opposed to mixing down in a 5-1 or 7-1 uh, scoring room and getting stems that are, you know, already set and you're still broken out, but set in that 7-1 environment, for instance. Um, now I'm finding that on the mix stage, for instance, I'm having to take stereo tracks and place them around the room accordingly. And I'm doing basically the mix down on the mix stage, on the dub stage. Yes, that is very common now. Uh, we'll get live strings and brass, maybe everything else is samples. But you'll get the five, five one of those, but all the rest are stereos. And right. yes, 
but you only have to do it once instead of. <laughs> well, yes, that's that. No, that's a good point. But in in with Dolby Atmos, when I want to have like the sense, yeah. like up above or something like that, sometimes I get something up since on the stack and I'm like I start rearranging things, you know? Yeah. So and yeah, it's not like how it used to be. Yeah. Well listen, I'm gonna we're gonna be coming back around and I'm sure that there's gonna be lots of questions for you because I think personally that there is less knowledge of your uh, niche than uh, a lot of others, because a lot of people are doing their own sound editorial, their own little mixing and their own Foley. Um, but the whole music thing is like a different ball of wax. And uh, a lot of people will, I think, have questions for you. Okay. Sure. Uh, let's move on. I wanted to talk with uh, Craig. Uh, we've worked together quite a bit and uh, had a lot of fun. Uh, and you are supervising a uh, sound editor. How is, uh, how are, how have things changed for you going from like big pictures? And I'm still, I know you're still doing big pictures, but there seems to be an awful lot more broadcast nowadays. Netflix is even sponsoring and budgeting for features to be done, but they, they want broadcast at most, but not theatrical at most. And, I mean, there's a whole different sort of sway these days. Right. Um, how are you finding that you are approached and how are you approaching, you know, the, the issues that you find are contentious? Uh, I, I, the common theme here obviously is time, right? And and uh, all of us on this panel, we have a, a level of work, a level of our, our internal, like we want it to be at a certain level, you know, and whether I'm, doing a streaming project or a feature, I still want to strive to make it what I feel is the utmost best, right? Um, you know, when right. I started doing the, the streaming things to me started showing up around 2015 and I would get call, I would get calls of like, we know you don't do TV, but we have this, you know, and, and, and one of them was, was a, was a thing called stranger things, which just turned into like everybody in the, you know, it just it turned into such a huge thing. But it was one of those projects yeah. where we didn't know it was going to turn into that, you know. Um, mm -hmm. But budgetarily, they gave me pretty much what I would have on a, on a sort of feature, sort of a mid-level sort of feature. So I, I felt like I was respected enough from a budgetary standpoint and a time standpoint that I could, I could sort of apply the cinema, like the film workflow, to this sort of streaming workflow. Uh, and I was also fortunate. Um, because I got involved with the first project I got involved that was uh, a Netflix thing was with uh, Dean Zimmerman, a, a film editor, and uh, the producer, Sean Levy, was a director I worked with a lot. So w the team sort of already had the cinema workflow already figured out. You know what I mean? Like we, I was I was brought on, you know, four or five months. We, we did a budget where I could I could chip away at certain things if I wanted to or if I could if I wanted to play around you know without any picture but i had maybe some animatics or i had a few jpegs of what the what a monster was going to look like or what you know what some artwork was going to be um that was all transferable from from sort of the film world over into the into you know the streaming um that i don't think necessarily is an isolated case for me but there definitely are other streaming shows that i do that are much more like oh this is kind of like the tv stuff that i started off in 25 years ago and yeah, you just don't, you know, you just when you were five years old, right? when I was five years old, exactly. <laughs> um, I think it's like having a great team around you, you know, like you, you, you just as a supervisor, you obviously have to really have some really great people around you that you can just let let run go and, and run with it. Mm -hmm. Um, and you've made your workflow more efficient by by working with the same team. All yeah, the you, you, you just everybody sort of seems to, you know, they know the drill. Um, I tend to, I try to make, for, from a sound perspective or a creative sound sort of side of it, I try to make as many ideas and new things and try to start a, like a little well of sounds for the show or the project early on. Um, and then I kind of at least have a jumping off point. So I'm not like starting from dead, dead stop and having to sort of like deliver a show in two weeks and, you know, right. 
to be super polished. Um, Dolby Atmos, you know, I tend to do a lot of, or get people to do a lot of what's called pre-premixing because I find that the premix on streaming projects isn't, there's just no time. There's a, they, they don't have time to be organizing and, and moving stuff around. I'm fortunate to work in a room at home where I can put stuff around in the ceilings and, um, and I can, I know that it translates enough that, that I can kind of like get it to a level that when it gets down to the stage, those guys can be thinking about it creatively. They're not, they're not scrambling to get everything, you know, going. Right. Um, you know, Alice let, let mentioned, me Alice your, mentioned Foley. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Go ahead. There are, but what you're describing is, is a, a certain, you know, efficiency and workflow. When you come across a producer that wants you to be involved in their show, mm. but it doesn't allow for the time for you to be doing what you normally do, um, but yet you want to do the project or right. whatever, how do you go about convincing the producer or the showrunner or whatever to either get you the time that you need or succumb to asking for less because you don't have the time. Right, right. I think, you know, part of the, the politics of it is to play it cool sometimes, you know, especially at the beginning of a project. You kind of like, you know, they come to you and they're like, they got X amount of money and this and that. And you're like, well, the reality is, you know, that's not going to get you what you what you want or what you need. You know, the, the worst word that I seem to get sometimes is like, we really want you to create signature sounds and signature this. And I'm like, you know what? George Lucas wasn't going to Ben Burt saying, create a signature sound for the lightsaber. It just doesn't work that way, you know? And mm -hmm. and that just puts an extra layer of pressure on people like me, especially on a smaller budget thing of like, you know what? Maybe this isn't actually worth me to do it. Now, if I really want to mm -hmm. do it, I have to have that connection with the director. And then a lot of those problems go away or, or they, they tend to work themselves out because, you know, the smaller projects tend to have post, post supervisors or producers that aren't very experienced. They may have not gone through the whole process. You know, you can't come across as sounding like a dick or a know-it-all because you've been in the business for a number of years. But, you know, we've been in the business for a number of years because we've been successful at what we do, right? So and yeah. what comes with that is actually trying to understand a schedule, understanding temp mixes and final mixes and kind of all the stuff that has to happen in between. You know, it's, it's a question of how much can you squeeze in you know, to the schedule that they have. And I find inevitably the schedules always open up. I don't know why or how, but they, they tend to always just open up. Even, even if it's a couple weeks, it tends to always happen. And generally, I think it's visual effects. It's the visual effects that always take so long that I've been able to, like, squeeze in an extra six weeks on something because the visual effects aren't right. Well, that, and, and part of part of your problem as a, uh, a supervisor is uh, communicating with the, the picture department about those those visual effects. Well, I mean, forget about it, right? I mean, and, yeah. yeah, and and also uh, the shock or surprise when you get a visual effect that's not nothing the same as what you had in there, and all of a sudden you're supposed to turn on a dime, you know? Right, and trying to get I mean, it. I mean, so the shots the same length. So it doesn't affect sound. Right. It's like, well, wait a minute. The bus is going direction. It's the action right. within exactly. the show. It's but, exactly. Uh, yeah. That's exa yeah, that's exactly it. And, and uh, you know, trying to get in front of that is just sometimes you can do all that legwork and it still changes because it's just that's just the nature of what we what we are and what we do. Again, that's what yep. sort of rely on your team and hopefully you rely on the sounds that you've made. And, and a little bit of instinct and a little bit of forethought, you can kind of get in front of most of those those things. Right. Um, yeah. Wow. Well, okay, great. I mean, we're going to come back to you. But I think uh, the the variety of work that you've done is going to uh, warrant a bunch of different questions down the line. Mm. Um, and, and I must say that your diplomacy and your the way you communicate with directors probably buys you that extra time i hope that you you know yeah that's hope so you know that, that goes a long way you know yeah um next up uh is lee orloff our production mixer 
Thank you, Gary. Uh, we were we were talking a little earlier about the fact that uh, the vast majority of people are are not experienced with knowing what issues and problems and things that you have to tackle um, on set. And the the primary thing that I have always thought was if there's a hundred people on set. There's basically three people that represent the sound department, maybe four if you're lucky, sometimes two. Um, but basically, you're, you know, you're fighting for the best quality that you could get. But there's a lot going against you. There's, you know, uh, wardrobe, there's camera, there's lenses, and there's all sorts of stuff. But I, I'm wondering what you envision is not just simply the technical uh, issues that you have to deal with uh, that are problems, but more the diplomatic issues dealing with, for instance, talent or uh, producers that are charging ahead too fast for you to get the set up and whatnot. How do you deal with the people uh, to to garner the freedom to do what you need to do to get a great job? Well, I, you know, I think my call sheet shows uh, lunch for 250 on this show. Um, and there's still three of us. Um, it's, it is what it is. I mean, that's, you know, whether you're on a big show, I mean, we're doing, um, you know, the typical uh, assignments that the production sound team will do. Plus we're also, uh, we have the, uh, the sound track that the uh, director is going to use. So we have that available for playback for cues. Um, we have uh, public address um, for voice of God that seems to work uh, increasingly regularly on set. Uh, these are extra things that are loaded on besides the fact that we um, are delivering um, many, many tracks for the three of us to manage. Um, everyone gets wired um, as well. Uh, that's just the way, well, I should say, everyone who speaks gets wired um, mm -hmm. because you never know what's gonna happen when you've got three cameras which is generally the way things work. When I started out, there was no video assist. There was no video village. There was a director on an Apple box next to the lens sitting by the uh, A camera dolly. And, uh, you know, we give him uh, context, but that was, that was the level of tech that was going on. Right now we have layers of, of villages um, that video is supplying, um, layers of monitors, um, the, the cast uh, count is, is larger. And, and so just to protect ourselves, I, I still want to do the best mix for the shot. I'm always hoping that what I do is going to be lifted from my mix, cut the slate off, it's gonna drop in, that's gonna be your dialogue track. But I'm mixing a shot, not a scene. So I don't know when it gets to editorial exactly how that scene is gonna be put together. So we ISO everything so that all of my elements that go into my mix are then available for post, for dialogue editors, for the, you know, basically to take it all the way with the maximum flexibility. But I hope that what I'm doing is uh, basically giving the director what he wants for that scene at the time that we're on set. Now, in order to do that, I have to try to convince many people to work with me. And the only way that I can do that properly is if everyone sees it as um, a collaborative process that I'm not looking at this for the sound department, I'm doing this for the movie. Right. I'm doing, I'm doing this for the performance because there may only be three of us on set, but what my contribution is later on is a much bigger experience for the audience. But I have to look out for all the sisters and brothers who are going to be dealing with what I give them from the set. And, and right. we're, this conversation, the topic is problem solving. I'm a conflict avoidant person. I've learned that from decades of being on set. I've learned that from my uh, hard earned uh, hours of therapy. I want, to, I, I, I want to do the best job I can do without poking the bear, without riling up all of the um, elements that could get in the way to be con um, uh, an issue. <laughs> yeah, and, and, an issue, right. You know, let me, let me ask we'll you create something. obstacles. When, and, you, and when you find yourself in a, a situation where you either need more time to set up or you're just getting resistance or whatever, 
who is it on the set that you go to to have a chat with or talked with to to alleviate the problem? Is well, it generally the producer or the director or or somebody else, production uh, manager? It, uh, no, I the, the way uh, the set is managed is the first assistant director is the one who manages time on the set. So uh, all, everything goes through the first assistant. So if I need more time, but the, the, the like I say, being conflict avoidant, um, I want to make sure that, you know, when we get started in the day that I have enough of a pre-call to take care of all the time code needs, to take care of all the communications, everything else that I have to do before I can even start working on the mix, then my team starts wiring up all the actors getting plant mics, booms in uh, position, ready for the scene. Um, that should be worked out in advance so that I don't have to ask for more time. That, right. that should be something that based on the scene that we're gonna shoot, based on the prelim call sheet that I get the day before, we discuss right. what, how much of a pre-call I need to be ready how, without asking. How much of, uh, uh, in advance of shooting, do you get, first of all, do you get a call? How far in advance do you get a call? Secondly, how much prep time are you given after having read the script and seeing that basically it's, it's a, a, a sort of a situation that's going to be problematic or whatever? How much prep time are you, are you given? Uh, generally, they would like me to show up 15 minutes before the cameras roll. <laughs> but, but I've also had long-term relationships with directors like Michael Mann, who will bring me on internationally for scouts. I'll be in Africa, Asia, because that's where we're going to be shooting the film. I'm there on the scout with him. When we did Collateral, I had a month to do all the tests. We had 13 different versions of that cab that Jamie Foxx um, was driving around with Tom in the back. Some of those cabs were self-drive. Some of them were half a cab. We built Hope mobiles around them so that they can mm -hmm. do a crane shot within the interior of the car. Everything was wire harnesses that could be moved from one car to the next. There was communication so that Michael could talk to the actors front and back. There's a plexi screen, so you needed speakers for both characters. Um, mm -hmm. I had a month. And we went out and we ran those things and we listened to what noises were coming off of the uh, trailer that those things were put on because the entire film took 65% of it took place in that cab. Michael right. understands that we, when we built the cabs, the entire interior was built with female Velcro so I could stick microphones where I needed to. The, the, uh -huh. the lighting department could put panels of luminescent uh, lights everyone was working together. That's a month. I, but I'm, I'm literally not joking when I say they want to bring me on 15 minutes before on most movies, you know, what, what yeah. do you need? What do you need to be here for? You know, you're just going to wire up the actors and because uh, as far as they're concerned these days, all you need to do is put a mic on an actor and that's it. And you're done. That's right. not my approach. That's not where I came from. I've been doing this for decades and that's, I, I want to still be able to control the way the film sounds dialogue wise right. good for you and you've done an excellent job okay. let me ask you something do you ever have confabs chats with location scouts if you're not uh brought in to go to places in advance to find out that you know you're shooting a western in a flight path and that sort of thing you know uh because i i quite often you know have to deal with production tracks that have noises on them that you can't see, so there's no rationale. Right. Well, that's, and that's, I always think to myself, why the heck did they, you know, shoot beside a freeway and there's, there's there's not supposed to be any cars? It's like this is a tad difficult. Do you ever have discussions with location scouts about that sort of issue? When we did the Patriot, um, there was so which was shot in uh, South Carolina, uh, there was so much stuff that was done exterior that uh, we knew that there was a train nearby we got the schedule for what that train was on a daily basis so that we knew when it came through how long it was going to come through and we made sure that we weren't be going to be in the middle of a dialogue scene when we were waiting for a freight train that had 85 cars that was going to roll through on the edge of the field so it right. was all it's all you know this is what prep this is what um cooperation is about i i deal with construction um you know if i'm shooting downtown we did something in the loft building where across the street from the loft the director wanted to have the windows you know these old you know uh, double hung wooden windows open because the scene you know 
that was the vision. But across the way, there was a restaurant that had a blower for the exhaust fan, and it had a noisy bearing on it. We contacted mm -hmm. the, uh, the restaurant. They would not let us come in and change the bearing, understood, because there wasn't enough time. So then we got construction to come in and build a false uh, cap for it that looked like it was a stairwell with sound deadening material in front of it mm -hmm. with one side open so that it wouldn't oh, overheat. Gosh. So there's the end of your problem. Yeah. But it's, you need right. you, 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 you to have You got cooperation. Yeah. I have, cooperation. I like I say, I can't do a good job without cooperation. Effects people need to be on context so that they know what the dialogue cues are. So when they're running fan machines, they can take it down a little bit. It, it's You're not going to notice the fan dropping down just enough that it's not going to get in the way of the dialogue. We're right. all part of the, like I say, it's for the movie. It's not for the sound department. You have to right. convince people of that, that we're all doing it for one thing. Right. Mm -hmm. And it, it, I just recently did a, a 20 minute short uh, and it was, you know, low budget. I did it at home right behind me here. And um, the, it seems to me that when there's low budget uh, films, young directors, they don't have the sense of priority of allowing the sound person to get their mics in there uh, or close enough or, or eliminate background hums and all that sort of stuff. Um, do you find that, I mean, you work on big budget uh, and, projects. And, 90 and, of the time, right? and small. And, and, I, and I tell them. That's what I was just going to say. That's what I was just going to say. Do you, what do you find the biggest difference? Is it just attitude that's the biggest difference or opportunity when you're doing something that's lower budget? Well, again, it always comes down to budget because, you know, I've done movies that were shot in 19 days. Um, and within a 19 day project, as opposed to 103, um, you have to approach your scenes, hopefully the way they designed it in terms of coverage, that those scenes can be shot in those 19 days and still get 90 minutes on the screen. So it's, a lot of it has nothing to do with me. It has to do with the way they have thought rationally about how to make a movie in four weeks. What, right. Once that's been done intelligently, then it's just a matter of convincing the uh, director and producer that the first thing that's going to make a film sound low budget is bad sound. And we're yeah, not going to and we're not going to let that happen because I'm going to convince them that that we will help elevate the quality of the film just by how much effort is put into making sure that that soundtrack is done properly. Yeah. Yeah. Well, uh, you've touched on something that I'm going to uh, talk with Dane about shortly, and, and we'll be coming back to you. But, um, Dane, I, I wanted to talk to you for a bit. Uh, I, I'm, I'm getting a, a sense or a thread that obviously what Craig had mentioned earlier and, and even Alex, but the, the time, the amount of time that we have is really highly indicative of what we can do or what we're allowed to do. And it seems also that it, that to a certain degree, the way the only way we are able to buy time is through educating the people that are in charge of the purse strings, which is like the producer, as sometimes the director or showrunner, whatever it is. But it's it seems to be an ongoing uh, responsibility or job to be educating. Uh, the powers that be as to not only what we do, but how much we can bring to the table if we're allowed the time to do it. Yeah, time, obviously, that's a common theme. Uh, Allison first brought it up, and then Alex, that's right. Craig, yeah. and then everybody. You know, <laughs> time is, a, you know, obviously, it's a limiting factor. It's a, it is, it's, you know, it's what defines your priorities. In, you know, in a lot of ways, uh, there's never enough time for anyone to do their job. Uh, it, you know, in answer to your question, it does make a giant difference when the post-production supervisor uh, or somebody does come to me and say, "Here is here is our schedule. This just happened a couple of weeks ago." You know, here's our schedule, and I look at the schedule and I you say this. This won't work, you know. I mean, and I can say that to myself and my crew. All <laughs> it, you know, it doesn't matter. We all say that, right? We all look at these schedules, these budgets, which are, you know, 
interrelated problems, but <clears throat> problems. But if they do come to me, and in this case, I went to a meeting and I said, "Look, this doesn't make any sense. This this won't work." And you know, and luckily in, in that case, they they're adding some days, adding some weeks. And, you know, things like uh, prepping a, a for a temp mix in, in one week. Uh, you know, I think in this case they had three days of prep for a three-day temp mix, and you know, or very little time for pre-mix. Those of us that have been doing this, which is everyone on this panel, for you know, for a long time since we were all five years old. <laughs> you know, our perspective gives us that kind of uh, X-ray vision, right? Mm -hmm. We can just look at the schedules and budgets, and we know exactly uh, what's plausible. And what's this? And who do you who do you talk to? Who do you find it most effective to do, talk to to buy yourself what you need? Is it is it the director directly? Is it maybe the picture editor, or do you go above them and go to the producer? What, who do you feel best uh, <laughs> enhances your ability to do it? You know. Well, like you mentioned earlier, you know, you you don't want to step on toes, so you have to go up the hierarchy steps. To I have, right. have been on movies where I literally went through everybody. No, 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 no. And I go to the producer and, you know, if you lay out your case, you say, this is why this isn't going to happen. A good producer will, will make it happen. Right. But, but first I, I always go to the post super and then the picture editor. Right. And, uh, and then the director, but I, you know, we all try to not bother directors with logistical issues. Yeah. That we try right. to have those conversations, especially when there's dollar signs on the logistics. Yeah. Who do you who do you go? Who do you make? On for instance, you've got a lot of relationships over the years, and you have you know clients that keep coming back. You know them well. But in this instance, I'm thinking when you're dealing with a new project with a new team and a new producer director, blah blah. blah you've been brought on because of your great work experience, etc. Um, who do you find it most uh, advantageous to? I'm not going to use this. This is going to be terrible. But who do you use to? Who do you feel that you should suck up to at the beginning? It's going to buy you what you need to do the quality work that that they all want to pie in the sky. They all want something marvelous and unique and, and whatnot. But that's that's a different reality than their budget, for instance. Who do you talk to first and get to know and and try to persuade what's best for them. Well, obviously, it depends on who brought me into the project. You know, which which existing relationship is this new job upon? Uh, so, certainly, that is the person that that line of communication has to uh, go through. Uh, if it's if, if everyone else is unfamiliar and, you know, we all know how this works, right? It's like there's five people making the decision and we've worked with two of them. That means three of the people making the decision have not worked with us, which means they've worked with other people. And right. It, it just comes down to this odd sort of uh, uh, weather pattern, you know, <laughs> right? All these actors like, oh, it's going to snow this afternoon. Stormy weather. <laughs> All these factors, right? There's this, this yeah. current coming from the North Pole. And, I mean, that's it, what it feels like. And I, I think you have to always navigate that, that, uh, those relationships because you, d <laughs> you don't want to give anyone ammunition. You know mm -hmm. what I mean? that wanted to hire someone else. I mean, I'll just say that, right? That's something we yeah, always yeah. have to think about. Is nobody wants to talk about politics, but that's part of it. So you try to... Well, part of politics is, uh, to me, one of the biggest uh, elements of this whole subject of problem solving, because let's face it, there are different agendas that, that go on. And I wanted to ask you specifically about this, but... Uh, for instance, you probably know my daughter, Sarah, and she's one of the, you know, I, in my opinion, top first assistants in sound, uh, you know, in town. Um, and uh, I must say, I get upset phone calls from her from time to time because she's having to deal with, for instance, uh, uh, a picture department who's got an assistant that doesn't respect what the sound department needs. 
uh, or the or our workflow or uh, our 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 requirements, for instance, you know. And uh, she she tries to be as diplomatic with uh, you know the the picture department assistant as as possible, but she's responsible to her supervisor for getting things done. Sure. And I think that the, the sound supervisor, like yourself, sometimes has to take aside the picture editor and like request greater cooperation. And that becomes very political. How do you handle those sort of things? Well, I, I, I think Alex I wasn't here to ask these right. questions, you know. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Okay. No, I, I think it was mentioned before, you know, you have to start out uh, low key, right? You, you, so you don't want to start out raising your hand and you know taking out your fire extinguisher, uh, you know, right? I think everybody's kind of alluded to that uh, perspective you have to have. So it it's when you start to feel the the alliance with people and and the uh, uh, the sort of team one team aspect of it, right? Like Lee was saying, right. in the art department and the car construction carpenters. You, you you have to feel that gel, and and it does it doesn't start out gelled with the picture department, you know. And certainly, if Sarah isn't familiar with the, the picture first, she has to navigate that as well. And as the, as the, the sound supervisor, we don't want to throw too many grenades over that wall, uh, you know, early. early. Right, because you have to get them to trust us. They have to trust the picture first. Has to trust the sound first, and everybody, the picture editor, has to trust the sound supervisor. You know, and 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 everybody, we're all just making the same movie, right? And I mean, like Lee said, you know, it's all about the movie. We have to say it's not about us. It's it, we don't need yeah. this so our lives can be easier. Or <laughs> right, it's it really never is about that. It's. It's about the movie telling the story as effectively as it possibly can. And that means the production town. It also means all of the sound and both of so the music and everything and the, and the mix being uh, adequately finessed to get there. So we really are making the same movie. But of course, there are people have different agendas and, and different priorities as well. You know, a big part of like uh, looking for alts, you know, for dialogue is a very tricky thing. And, and yeah. we've Right, because mm -hmm. picture systems don't have any time uh, to to be looking for that, and we don't necessarily. A lot of movies they don't have something like script sync, right, which is a program that can find every reading of that one phrase or line in every day, which is great for our dialogue editor, uh, uh, supervisor on the post side. Uh, but I, I have found that to be one of the trickiest negotiations, <laughs> right. that one little topic, uh, mm -hmm. you know. Obviously, the other anything to do with turnovers is a big one. Right, uh, right. right. It's just hard for everybody. And uh, but we, you know, you have to be friends. I, you know, sometimes you start out; it feels very antagonistic because everybody's pressured. The picture assistants, picture editor, they certainly don't have enough time to do their uh, jobs either. So, but almost always, by the time you get to the dub stage, hopefully, right, it's one big team. Hopefully. Yeah, sometimes. <laughs> you know, sometimes I, I'll be, you know, optimistically yeah. assessing. Yeah. I, I have a, a, a global uh, question. Uh, and and we can start to just weigh in. I don't see, I don't have a chat uh, thing on my screen, so I don't see any questions coming in. And if I'm incorrect about that, uh, it, maybe Carol can uh, let me know that. Whatever, but um, so hold on a second. Uh, oh, here we are. Okay. Oh, five million questions. I don't see it. <laughs> you oh, had to okay. ask, right? They're all for yeah. They're all for you, Dane. <laughs> I have three in a queue. Do I go to chat or team? I'm getting. Uh, sorry. You've uh, got mail. <laughs> Okay, I'm on. I'm on team. Okay. Yeah, I've got mail. God, I've got mail. I hate this <laughs> idea. Okay, well, before I before I stop all the flow altogether, one of the sort of global questions I was thinking was that um, this isn't always the case by a long shot, but it's it occurs enough that it 
to me sometimes get gets irksome and and if you guys don't have this issue at all but i I've, I've quite often found that um, as much as uh, the client quite often wants us to be very creative and artistic um, things like buttons all around us or not that uh, quite often uh, there's a sense that we're treated as technical uh, but and, and only technical or um, have a limited uh, creative input compared to the picture department who uh, seem to quite often uh, not reach out necessarily for input, uh, creative input on how to do a scene or what we can do with sound. In other words, basically, um, there's a maybe a limited education as to what we can, in fact, bring to the table. And I might be completely wrong, but I mean, the, the few times that you're really allowed to stretch, experiment, and really bring something to the table, they're always kind of like, oh, wow, that's really great. And as opposed to, you know, yeah, yeah good. You did, the, you did the right thing. You really stretched. And, and, and other people just want to tell you what they want as opposed to being open to the creative input from our seat. <laughs> Well, it, it, any thoughts about that? That's open to yeah, anybody. Uh, yeah, I, I mean, I, I'll just say that it, it doesn't. It does go both ways, right? I mean, a, a lot of times, if I mean, obviously, we have to, we're all responding to the picture department, you know, in the hierarchy. You know, that's how it works. But sometimes we can help them make the picture cut work better just by suggesting mm -hmm. certain sounds, right? Like pre lapse and off-screen things like beats that are there in the script, they're in the story, they're not necessarily in the cut because the picture editor, unless they're very intuitive and very adept with cutting in sound, they're not really thinking about that. And that's where that relationship is important, right? When, when they will, when we can sit down with the picture editor and say, open up that cut, right? Give us 15 frames and we yeah. can put car horn there mm -hmm whatever it is, gunshot, you know, you name it, cat meow, you know, right. sets up the cut. So now the audience is following that beat. Instead, it's all happening at the same time. Right. Alex, when, uh, there is, I just wanted to ask, um, I, I don't get called anymore to go into a spotting session much. It's just stuff comes for the mix. And I mean, the supervising sound editor quite often does, but not the mixer. And, but there are many times, for instance, that in your situation, you get to proffer that maybe the music should stop on the cut because it's a whole new feeling, or maybe it, it's a, a continuity. And can we take this across the cut? And, and because, you know, starts and stops quite often are uh, dictated by the director's uh, want. But sometimes you can see where it would have a whole different meaning if it started and stopped somewhere else, you know? Uh, yeah, but as far as spotting sessions, don't have them much anymore. It's the, you, we just bounce off how we react to temp. And uh, it, it kind of forms that way. Right. But usually, uh, you got, if you have too many starts and stops, you're going to feel it. It's going to be terrible. So usually what you're doing is eliminating cues or trying to tie them together. Right. right. But I do get some say in things, but it's not my yeah, film. I well, I, I must say that there are times when I, I kind of wish I was in the spotting session because you, <laughs> you see opportunities when you're at the final mix and you're given the score and it's, coming out before the cut and then the new cut start, and it's like well these are similar ideas it would have been nice to bring it across and now it's too late i can't do anything about it you know i can't put 14 seconds of verb on on the tail of, of the music you know so you don't have that plug in uh, well i do <laughs> we don't want to use it necessarily drone, drone maker 
<laughs> the spotting sessions that I've been to lately, they're really quick. It's all about them telling me and sound what they want. That's yeah. it. There's no like creative chat wow. that I've noticed. What a pity. There's no time. Good. Director's in there for three hours in a day. You got you get two days. That's it. Yeah. Okay, listen. Yeah. I'm going, oh, order I just, here and I'm going to uh, read. What's that? I'm sorry. No, I was just. I was just going, going to, to read the question. What's that? Go ahead, Lee. Yeah, I was just going to say that there is a. Uh, there's been a tendency for a uh, a dumbing down of our contribution sound to the overall creative process that goes back to uh, what you were saying you know, before, years ago, it was only half a jest that Jim Cameron um, referred to what I do or what we do as uh, knob twirling button pushers. Mm -hmm. um, and that part, which is trying to elevate the sense of our contribution as a creative part of the experience mm -hmm. um, and not just that we're technicians. Um, has been has been going further and further down that road. And, and what I brought up before, um, the notion that now, especially among younger producers, the idea that all they want to know is, are the actors wired? From my perspective, that's all they care about is if there's a microphone on an actor, then you're going to be able to deliver what we need dialogue wise for the scene. And that is not the essence of what we do when we um, right. create the production soundtrack. Sometimes the they're fabulous tools, believe me. I, I started off at a time when the wireless were so terrible that you'd only use them on masters. You'd hope to get off of them because they were big, they were clunky, they were unreliable. They're great tools now, but they're not the only way that we get the job done. And sometimes they're not the best way to get the job done. And right. so in the same way that the DP has his arsenal of lenses, and camera moves and 50 foot cranes. We have our arsenal that we can subtly craft that job. And we all do it now with the plugins, with everything that you have in post, we all have these things that allow us to do far more uh, subtle and delicate decision-making all the time in our work. But the problem is that there are people that don't understand the creativity that's involved with, there's no right. book. No, I don't show up on set and someone told me that's what I'm going to do because every situation is different. Sometimes I'm 35,000 feet up in a plane with Michael Mann. We're shooting as the sun comes up on Ali or we're building a 7 million gallon tank. And I've got to come up with ways to get wires into the subs with with underwater mateable bulkhead connectors. All these decisions are things that are part of what we do that allow that film to breathe with life and emotion. Right. And that right. process has been dumbed down to the point where we have to say, raise our hand and say, hey guys, we're part of the creative process. Right, right. And, and I must say that. I just, it, it, just it, have to say that. that. Yeah, yeah. And, and, and in production, that's completely understandable. For what it's worth, when you sit in a mix stage and you sit in a console with 5 million knobs and whatnot, they always come in and go, oh, wow. And then, the assumption is because there's a lot of knobs and it's a big, you know, thing. Uh, the, is that well, if you know how to work this, you're a technician. It's like no, it's the same as a Formula One car driver. It's uh, you know, you you have to know how the car sort of works. But I'm not a mechanic. I'm a driver. Right. Yeah. Or well, violinist. What I'm bringing to the the table is something that's creative. You know. Right. So. And there's different kinds of creativity too. I mean, I have to say, when I met Lee. Lee was facing all the usual problems he has to deal with. But in this case, all the actors and the director and most of the crew were underwater in that tank that you just <laughs> wow. That's a, a little extra consideration. It, and you had to do a, a lot twist. Of creative, right? Yeah. You had a lot of yeah. creative problem solving. I remember walking into the trailer, and obviously this is on the abyss, uh, right? And you had a billion huge black wires right, coming out of all your gear. And if you follow the wires, they all went. Into, the, into the tank. That's right. <laughs> Everything went into the tank. And yeah, the lights like were the in the, the actors' helmets. 
So <laughs> is that technical? You know, it's technical yeah, solutions, right. but it's creativity. Yeah. That's right. right. You, the objective is to get capture the act. That's the point. I'm going to read uh, the first question, and and whoever wants to respond, just go for it. But a question for the panel: What do you all prioritize? in your personal lives to keep your mind centered and body healthy to help you combat the fatigue of our deadline pressure. I, I, I got That's home really last night at 11 o'clock and I was zombified, you know. Um, that's a tough one. Uh, weigh in. Who, out, who, who wants to uh, profess a, a uh, having gotten a solution to the the wear and tear that we go through <laughs> stretching lots of stretching and that yeah. do a lot of, i do a lot of neck stretches and stuff i, I carry a lot of my from i guess mixing and stuff just like right here my shoulders so i have to end up doing a lot of stretching uh, uh, i'm off you know after yeah. gotta take gotta take some time off take off yeah take time Our, off um yeah you know, I, I was telling you, Gary. A week or two laying on the beach in Cabo or something uh, does have a tendency to regenerate. Yeah, I, I was saying to you, Gary, uh, in the green room before we started that I just got back from a 30 mile bike ride. Mm -hmm. um, that I do not think about anything except that ride because I'm keeping myself safe. It's, mm -hmm. it's one of those things that is completely immersive. And the last thing I'm thinking about is some email that I'm getting about whether the LTOs cleared over the weekend from <laughs> Thursday's work. I'm thinking about the bumps in the road, the guy who's basically passing me, who's riding up my tail. You know, is that's Zen. I mean, that's riding my wave. And the last thing I want to do on the weekend, and like I said, it's conflict avoidance. I want to get all that stuff out of the way. So when they say wrap on Friday night, I don't think about it until I, I show up Monday morning. Yeah, right, right. I must say that. Uh, I, I swim, you know, uh, re quite very regularly and I do like 45 minutes and I, and I, I'm problem solving in my mind for the first seven or eight minutes. And the joy of, of doing something as repetitive as like bicycling or swimming or, or whatever, is that you eventually go away into a, a zone. And, and when you're, when you're finally finished, it, uh, cathartic and and you know clearing uh and and if 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 people find something that they can do that it just takes you completely away from all the pressures and stresses yes. and uh, it, it it then finds a way of saying to yourself i pri i've prioritized i need this you know get a bird feeder i'm telling you <laughs> i just sit outside because i feel like i'm in this quiet space that's you know it's just this your sensory is so mm -hmm. you know you just need to be outside in nature basically but i think we I all think have that, to find, i think we all have to find something yeah. that does that zen like experience to get us away mm -hmm. from it i know craig's got a beautiful cars that he likes to zip around in, and that in itself is really relaxing mm -hmm. i mean i think we all we all are adept at um taking like a car or mechanical things and being so easy with it because that part of our nature is to be creative through a, a certain type of vehicle, certain type of uh, uh, process, you know? And uh, the bottom line is, is that we have to look for something that allows us to do what we like to do the best uh, mm -hmm. and, and give us time to de-stress, you know? Right. Because our brains can only really so much right i mean that that is part of our the equipment that we bring so giving yeah. it back, like i run as often as possible craig mentioned stretching and biking yeah. you, you do have to take care of our it's a physical machine here and yeah even if you only have a short break like i do a lot of stretching too but i i always found when i i'm sort of hitting a wall creatively i just get up and i would just run the, down the floor down the steps and up the other side or wherever on, yeah. you know on the dubbing yeah. stage yeah. You know, on big yeah. stages, you can, it's quite a nice circumference you can run around. <laughs> I find yeah, just, yeah, yeah. right, it, it, on top yeah, of yeah. the mental Without, part of it. You know, uh, we, I think we all try to get out of the room and go outside for just a few minutes at least. You can. I, I brought up, I brought up something to, um, 
the head of the CBS lot at one point. We were just sitting, chatting, and having lunch. And I, I told him, I said, you know, I work in a room in which plants can't grow. <laughs> <laughs> and you know, because all day, every day, I'm in mean, a dark room. And actually, in fact, because of you know old projectors and whatnot, we were a third of the time sitting in a completely black room. You know, but um, and, and his response, uh, without saying, anything, the department on the lot, bring in trees and plants onto the mix stage, and they they switch them out every week. I couldn't believe it. But for years, I was there afterwards, and I had beautiful plants on the stage and whatnot. And because the head of the studio thought it's important for Gary to, to feel like he's part of the world, you know. Um, so I've, well, got a, I've, we only got get I've only got a few more minutes, and I've got two, two questions here, okay? Uh, for the panel, uh, Gilly Moon, on the sound design, the sound effects, are you sending things to directors prior to seeing a picture come if they have requests for specific sounds, do you find that the directors typically need a visual reference to go with the sound to really develop an opinion? Uh, that goes for music too, and even even Foley, because you, sometimes it's unique to the the monster or the character or whatever like that. Do you guys find that you uh, work with a director before there's a visual at all? Yeah, I mean those are a lot of questions. I mean Craig. You kind of, you know, we're in similar situations, right? Mm -hmm. But everything depends on that show, right? And what the genre of the show is, but also the schedule and uh, how much lead time you have. But, but yes, definitely. Sometimes we look at artworks, like Craig was saying earlier. You just get some dead bags. That's what you got. That's what the creature looks like. Uh, right. I, I have always found that any discussions where the sounds can evolve as, as early as possible is, is best in the long run. And that's right. the big challenge for, you know, for, for Alex and, and Craig and I, especially, is that that first temp mix is so critical. That's where you define so many things. And then, mm -hmm. as other people mentioned, because some directors get stuck, right? Certainly mm -hmm. on music and with sound effects and everything. They, they get stuck with what they heard in the first temp, and yet we have so little time on that first temp. So, I think it is essential. That Unfortunately, discussions they, they, quite quite often they get lost. It's like uh, you know that garage sound that you know that, that the temp love, where it was threw together. Know, yeah, exactly. And, and one last question, okay? Uh, question from the panel: What are some questions you ask, or things that you research, or look to observe in your clients? In order to help you understand their vision, I, I I mean I always I always say to some of the younger people coming along, is if you can go to lunch with a director and actually relate to them as a person, relate to them mm -hmm. talking about art, movies, whatever. I feel sometimes that goes a lot further. That's a big thing than yeah. people realize that that actual, yeah. you know, directors they they are surrounded by. You know, dozens of people, sometimes hundreds of people a day, definitely on set. So to, to sort of like be able to relate to somebody and, and sort of like, you know, and I'm not, you mentioned sucking up to them, you know, sucking up earlier on. Not necessarily that, but just getting to know them and getting to sort of, yeah. like, you know, everything from where they came from, what, what yeah. education is, well, maybe I, school, art, you know, all that is, it pays off. The more that we, we interact with the clients and have them realize that what we do isn't just who we are. Right. What what we bring to the table is the fact that I went and saw a concert. I went to hear, hear some jazz. I read a new book. Yeah. I read the newspaper or whatever, you know, the news each, each morning so I could be current and talk to the clients and make them have them realize, oh, there's a thoughtful person behind this console that that is bringing something to the table that I can rely on. Their opinion isn't just opinion of a technician but in fact the opinion of a, a thoughtful person right nice nicely said yeah right. and someone that has Great. passion you know yeah. white directors are just right. looking for passion so if it's passion about opera or or microbiology you know yeah whatever yeah. it is i i and there are some directors that uh, you know we talk 95 percent about everything except the movie about the sound yeah and the sound yeah, yeah. 
Yeah. Listen, I'm I'm going to wrap this up. Apparently, we're supposed to finish at two o'clock, and I, I think I should wrap it up. I, I want to say what you just finished saying uh, is that we're all here because we've been passionate about what we do all our lives. We have a certain high standard that we reach for, and more importantly, we we want to make sure that the audience is entertained in the way in which the director had had the vision to communicate with them. I thank you all, all, all your input, and uh, hopefully we'll have more of these in the future, and we can all get involved again. You know, all right. Great, <laughs> Gary. Thanks, everybody. Thank you, thank you everybody. Thank you, Alex Craig. Okay.